Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel, Life as a Law Student. As you know, or maybe don't know, my name is Nicole and I am a second year law student at Washington University in St. Louis. Today I've invited a bunch of friends, some old, some new, to talk about what the legal world is going through right now as we transition uh, from an in-person experience in court and school to almost entirely online. I'm going to have some of my friends introduce themselves and then we will jump into the discussion. So uh, let's start with someone that you all are familiar with, my friend from New York, Steve Schwartz. Hey, Nicole. Thanks so much for having me, everyone. Welcome. So uh, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I've been teaching the LSAT since 2005 and lots of changes recently with the LSAT moving online to the new LSAT Flex. Excited to talk more about that shortly. Uh, let's go to our other Schwartz on the panel. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Yes, no relation to Steve Schwartz, uh, I, although I am originally from New York and New Jersey. Uh, my name is Rob Schwartz. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at UCLA Law School. I've been here now for 14 years. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Leslie, why don't you go ahead next? Hi, my name is Leslie Tenzer, and my mother's maiden name was Schwartz, so <laughs> I'll just join in on that. Um, I am the James D. Hopkins Professor of Law at um, Elizabeth Halp School of Law at Pace University, where I teach contracts, torts, and commercial law, and I'm also the host of Law to Fact, which is a podcast for law students. Um, we talk with professors about learning about the law. Kamisha, let's do you next. Hi, everyone. My name is Kamisha. I'm from the YouTube channel It's Kay Yvonne. I'm a recent law school graduate from Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. I'm so excited to be here and I am currently studying for the bar. Yay. <laughs> and last but not least, by any means, Madison Rector. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. I'm so excited for this. Um, my name is Madison. I'm a 1L at Washington University in St. Louis. So been really crazy trying to navigate this and having all my first law classes online definitely been insane yeah and Madison you and I have been trying to get on a video together for a while since we both go to the same school but because everything is online we've never actually met each other so hello nice I know it's so weird this is definitely long awaited for sure so I'm really excited for our discussion today because we are covering as many of the areas of law that I could think of, at least on the professional career journey. So um, let's maybe do this on a chronological basis, starting from studying from the LSAT. Steve, could you give us a quick synopsis on how the change to moving online has affected your business and your students as they study for the LSAT? Yeah, sure, Nicole. It's definitely been a big change. I was doing a lot of classes in person in New York City had to move everything online. Luckily, I'd already started transitioning online for quite a while, so I was no stranger to Zoom. Now I'm just basically doing more of everything I was doing previously. It used to be two to four classes per month. Now it's more like two to four classes per week. And then in parallel to that, the LSAT went from being paper and pencil to being digital on a tablet starting last year. And now, due to COVID, they had to move it to the online LSAT Flex being proctored by a company called ProctorU. So they watch you with a webcam and a microphone. They shortened the exam from five sections to only three. And there have been some tech snafus as to be expected with any technological transition. And hopefully, and I am seeing in fact that largely it's getting better with each subsequent LSAT administration. So as for the big question, whether this will be the new normal, can't say for certain, but I suspect that at this point, they've already done like five or six LSAT flex administrations. I wouldn't be surprised if it were online flex long-term. Now, to my knowledge, Madison especially, correct me if I'm wrong, but none of us took the LSAT flex, correct? No, and I am so jealous to hear that it is only three <laughs> sections now. That makes me so angry that I missed out on that. That's insane. Yeah, and from home too, so you don't even have to go anywhere. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah, but I just remember with the digital LSAT, I took it the first time they administered it. So you either got the written or the digital, and there were so many problems with it. So 
it's interesting to hear that as they move with the flex, it's getting better slowly but surely every time they administer it. I'm pretty excited about this. I mean, the fact that anyone could do it anywhere in the world nearly every single month, that's the long-term vision, at least that I see. That's pretty exciting not to have to travel to take this. Rob, have you noticed as you're going through students' applications a big difference in their applications as a result of taking the digital LSAT or LSAT Flex? Well, the biggest change I'd say uh, for me is the fact that the writing sample is now uh, typed instead of handwritten. So that has really held my eyes uh, <laughs> a lot. It was always hard to uh, make your way through those handwritten uh, writing samples. But other than that, uh, not really. I think it'll be interesting to see now that the LSAT is being offered more, if people are taking it more uh, often. Steve may have some sense of that. Uh, but no, in, in terms of the admissions process, we're treating the LSAT flex just like we would treat um, the regular uh, former LSAT exam. So no major changes other than the, the typed writing sample. Okay, that's good to know. I, I think I would be really worried about that if I was applying to law school right now. Um, speaking of which, Robin, Leslie, I'm hoping you both can kind of contribute to this. What has it been like as a faculty member or a, a staff or administrator at a law school during this transition to online? Well, the sad thing is I don't get to see the students and I don't get to have office hours with them in person. But because of the Zoom breakout rooms, I've been able to get to know students. So I'll give a problem and then some students will come into the breakout room. So I do think that students can feel like they have a connection with the professor. I think the biggest problem with Zoom online teaching is that from the student perspective is to stay focused because I can tell you that there's a lot of times where people are looking like this at me, but I know that they're not paying attention, that they're checking their emails or, or and then some people just, and the other thing is um, some people, you know, in the beginning didn't know that you had to get out of bed and sit at a desk to take a class, but we would call them out and say, make your bed. Um, but pedagogically, um, and, and all of the professors have agreed with me on this, it's a lot more work for the faculty. Um, I think that the deliverables are a little more um, lecture oriented than Socratic, but we still do the Socratic method. And I think that the classes are run well with this expectation that students are fully prepared. And I think to this, you know, still, even though it's online, if a student's fully prepared, they'll get a lot more out of class than if they just come and turn on um, the, the computer. So just to summarize my very long answer, I guess, I think we're delivering the same quality, but not necessarily in the same room. I think it's tough for the students to stay distracted. And I know like if I get a text while I'm teaching, it's tough to ignore it. So, yeah, I, you know, I would say from the, on the administrative side, it, it was a challenge. I mean, we had to pretty much within 24 hours, we were told that UCLA pack up, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be doing everything online. And I think we managed uh, pretty well. We were able to function and continue to uh, get our admissions decisions out. What I, I really felt bad for the uh, incoming students and Madison can probably speak to this too, but you know, typically we always encourage people to visit law schools when they're deciding where to go. And we just weren't able to offer much of, if any, of an in-person experience. So we tried to do a lot of our, move all of our programming really online. And I, I think we did okay. You know, we were admitted students were able to meet with faculty, were able to meet with other current students, uh, even some alumni. Um, but it wasn't exactly the same as getting that in-person feel. Um, and so that has carried over to this year. Uh, right now, prospective students aren't able to visit. We're offering virtual tours online and virtual class observations, but it's just not the same as, you know, being on the campus and seeing what that experience is going to be like. And, you know, I, I, I just want to speak to what Rob was saying, and, and Madison, maybe you've experienced this. A lot of schools, mine included, are doing, um, for the students who are on campus, are doing this hybrid experience where one day you're in class and the other day you're on Zoom. So, and the students kind of are told you come to class and you leave. Um, so they're not getting to know each other. Even the, the one else who are on campus are having a tough time really getting to know each other because the mix changes and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so it is, it is kind of difficult. I actually, going off of what Rob was saying, I did get to visit WashU two weeks before everything shut down. So I'm just, I'm very thankful for that. I can see how it would be very difficult 
after I got accepted, WashU did try. They were like, here, we'll connect you with an alumni. We'll connect you with an upperclassman. But it really just, it isn't the same. I have nothing to compare it to, but I know that it isn't the same. And yeah, we, so for one L's, two L's and three L's right now aren't even allowed in the building. We can go in the building one time a week for one class if we chose the hybrid option. And it is kind of weird because it's like rush in, you sit for class, and then immediately after class, you have to leave. So it is kind of hard to make connections. Networking has been really hard. Um, but other than that, I don't really feel like the quality of education is worse. Personally, I really don't think it is. It's just harder to connect with the people around us. Kamisha, I was wondering if I could bring you in on this as well as a recent law school graduate. I mean, you had two and a half ex you know, years of a normal experience, and then all of a sudden it completely ended overnight, um, like Rob was saying. So maybe you could speak to kind of comparing what your experience was versus how it actually ended. All right. So like you said, I had two years, two and a half years of law school where I was going in, sitting in classes. And a uh, majority of my law school career, I chose to go uh, the route where I was involved in clinics and negotiation classes. So it was more like um, a hands-on role with um, clients. And so during my last year, when we got that shift, it was very difficult because it was like, how do you engage with your clients that you can no longer see? And for me personally, I was involved in a mediation practicum. So that involved me going to court and mediate cases and I can no longer do that. And I, like the requirement of the class was get 13 mediations to complete your practicum. And now my whole, pro my whole class had to adjust. My professor had to adjust. She had to figure out how can my students get that credit when they're no longer able to go to court. So it was, I think I was on the end of things where professors, students were all trying to figure it out. They didn't know if we should still implement grades. Um, I remember we ended up going to a pass-fail system. And, you know, this was very disheartening for some who's been working hard on their grades, knowing that now that we're going to a pass-fail, it might affect if you could get cum laude or summa cum laude. Um, and I just think it was a very hard transition um, especially if you were involved in classes that travel, for instance, I was like an ITP Greece, I can no longer go to Greece. So just figuring out how do you handle these changes, how to keep your students engaged after they're being disappointed with things that they have, you know, prepared for or wanted to take their entire, you know, law school career, or for me, I wanted to finish out my law school journey traveling. I was like, wow, let me go to Greece. Let me talk to my law clients there. So just figuring out how to, you know, still be engaged. I think it was just, it was just rough. I hate to say it. I, I did not like how my law school ended on that note, but I think the good side of it is now for the one else, like in Madison's case, I feel like they had time, the professor's administration had time to, you know, handle the kinks and figure out how to make it work. Unlike where it was me, it was everything was so rushed. The pandemic was now, you know, how do we handle it? How do we use Zoom? How do we mute? How do we unmute ourselves? So I think now I think, at least according to Madison, that they have a better <laughs> adjustment of how to handle things. Yeah, and I can speak to that too as somebody who did experience going through it last semester and is now experiencing this semester. It is much better for sure in the fall than it was in the spring. I will say, I still have professors who don't know how to record a class or mute themselves. Um, but we're slowly getting there. And I think the students have figured it out enough so that we can help the professor. We'll just jump and be like, you need to press this button and then that one. And we're all in this together. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a weird time. Madison, I specifically wanted to ask you too, what made you decide to go to law school this year because I know if it was me or a bunch of my friends we all have said like we would have just deferred if we knew this is what we were getting ourselves into as a 1L. A hundred percent I got asked this so many times like are you crazy why aren't you deferring this is such a weird time to go to law school and honestly I think the sole reason was because I just graduated from undergrad so I was very in a school mindset 
And I was very much like, I need to start law school now. If I don't start law school now, who knows if I'll ever go. So I just need to suck it up and I need to start. But I think if I would have been out of school for a couple of years, I completely would have deferred. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, Rob and Steve, as you've been interacting with students who are preparing to go to law school, have you seen that happen with many people? Have they been deciding to defer or asking for more accommodations now that school's going to be online? Well, you know, it's interesting. I got this question a lot over the summer, and uh, we actually did not see more people defer requests to defer their admission than, than typical. We, the reasons for the deferrals changed a little bit. So there certainly were people who asked to defer because of COVID. They didn't want to go in an online environment, but it wasn't more than usual. So, you know, in the past, maybe I would have had more people request a deferral because they got a job somewhere um, and they wanted, or they wanted to travel, um, you know, or something like that. So that, that really wasn't happen, hasn't really happened. And interestingly enough, nobody in the 1L class has left. Um, and I've had a few emails with students uh, where they say, you know, we, we really don't have anything to compare it to. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's not so bad, you know, and if it had to be during any one year, the 1L year is when you're supposed to be studying a lot anyway. So, um, you know, they're able to, to manage. And actually just the other day, I, uh, one of our faculty members sent out an email about certain benefits that nobody had ever thought of to the online learning world, like the chat room, for example, where, you know, while class is going on, uh, somebody may pose a question and then another student might actually chime in and, uh, and, and give an answer. And, you know, in, in the regular classroom, people would raise their hands, maybe get tired of raising their, their hands after a while, but, or if they're shy, maybe put it down, but on Zoom, right, they just click the raise hands and it, it stays there until the uh, professor gets to you. And then Another example he gave was the breakout room option, whereas if he wanted to have small groups in the classroom, they would all, you know, would be kind of noisy and small groups would be trying not to disrupt each other, but in the, in the breakout rooms, they can just talk amongst themselves. So it hasn't all been bad. And then a one out wrote to me yesterday how awesome it is to just roll out of bed. And uh, I don't know if he makes his bed, uh, but, um, <laughs> but you know, no yeah. commute. And in LA, you know, commute is a big deal. So that, that's been a plus. I know, being from LA, it's definitely a big deal. I have a class at 7.30 in the morning this semester. You oh, wow. best believe I'm waking up at 7.25 for that. <laughs> Yeah, there actually are a lot of benefits, if I could chime in on this one as well. There are a lot of benefits logistically, like rolling out of bed, not having to commute. If you're a non-traditional student, it's easier to fit law school in with work and or family. And while going to law school online during COVID may not be what you were hoping for, there's not really anything you could do during COVID that would be what you were hoping for. Everything requires some kind of adjustment. So the question is, what's the opportunity cost? I might find some students who are taking a step back to retake the LSAT and wait a little bit longer to apply. But then again, opportunity cost, what else are you going to be doing during this time anyway? So I actually don't think it's that big a decision changer as you might typically expect for the average student. And Steve, it, it, you might, I think you would know this better. I, I've heard that now LSAC is allowing people to see their score, right? Before they and decide if they want to cancel. So that's sort of a new development. Yeah, there's a new score preview option for first time test takers only. So if you've taken it before, even if you cancel, that's your one shot. But it's nice to diminish the stress associated a little bit to get to see your score. And as you know, law schools typically don't average multiple scores, is my understanding. So it's not a huge game changer. But psychologically, it does give test takers a little bit of a peace of mind, especially during COVID and given the tech, the flex, LSAT flex tech issues, anything that mitigates the stress is certainly welcome. Leslie, it looked like you had something to say earlier. I just wanted to make sure you <laughs> No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just gonna quickly follow up on Rob, but one of the other benefits of this is that more students come to office hours. Students aren't running here, running there. And I'm finding that so many more students are coming to office hours and staying in office hours. Kamisha, you're gonna go next, uh, if you could, to, for you to include a, a little bit about what your experience has been, um, you know, studying for the bar in this environment and starting your practice of law. Talking about the bar is definitely uh, <laughs> probably going to have to be done in another video because there's a lot <laughs> to say about what's going on with the bar right now. 
you may or may not know, every state is trying to figure it out, um, trying to figure out what works best for their state. And that means some states are taking the bar um, in person, some states are taking it online. Um, and I am taking the Maryland bar. It was originally supposed to be the Maryland UBE, but now they are not doing a UBE, still doing the UBE test, but it's not being, the score is not being portable anymore. So it's just very frustrating. Um, I mean, the benefit of it, it, of it all is that we get to take the tests online and the test is cut in half. Um, so instead of having 200 multiple choice questions, we have 100. Instead of having six essays, we have three. Um, instead of having two MPGs, we have two. But the bad side of it is like technology can easily fail us all. I, I just think like when you're studying, you try to be in a legal environment or a, a place where you can stay focused and not everyone has that home environment to stay focused. Um, and it's just very, it's just very hard studying for a test for four months. There's no way we should be studying this long. And I, I just, there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> well, in the interest of time, we're going to do this second part uh, a little differently than I originally planned and ask you to kind of give a brief prediction of maybe what the next five years or longer may look like with the shift to online, whether you think it's going to everything go back to normal, certain things are going to stay the same, whatever it might be. And then a piece of advice that you would have for people entering law school or maybe new to law school um, with that in mind, if that makes sense. Steve, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks again for organizing this panel. Uh, my prediction is that the LSAT will remain LSAT flex long term. There may be the occasional opportunity to do it in person, but I suspect that the majority of test takers going forward will take the LSAT flex, meaning online from home. And my piece of advice for future law applicants is that while the LSAT as a whole is incredibly important for admissions, no one particular test date will make or break you. You can retake and your LSAT score does not define you. Yeah, well, thanks, Nicole, also for organizing this and, and including me. This has been a, a very interesting uh, discussion. I, I Predictions are hard. Uh, I do think in, in the admissions uh, scheme side of things, I, it'll be interesting to see, but I think there's a, a good possibility there'll be an increase in the number of applicants uh, this year. The Law School Admissions Council has shifted to these virtual forums, and the first one is this Saturday. And the last time I checked, there were more than 9,000 uh, prospective students registered. So there does seem to be a lot of interest out there. My advice to prospective students is uh, don't be shy about uh, doing your research and getting uh, the information you need to make an informed choice and to get the answers to the questions you have about the admissions process and any schools that you might be interested in. There are many ways, even though you may not be able to visit in person, there are many ways to reach out and get information. And people like myself, admissions officers, uh, want to help you as best they can. Thank you. Also, I want to thank you for having me. So the American Bar Association, which regulates law schools, has been stubborn with respect to how many credits a law student can have with online learning. So I suspect that because of this, it may push the envelope a little quick, more quickly and um, the American Bar Association may be more likely to increase the number of online learning hours a graduating student can have. With respect to um, advice, uh, as the three of you know, there are no shortcuts. You cannot cram for a law school exam. So practice discipline and minimize distractions. Act as if you're in the classroom and others are watching and take in everything you can. Um, I guess if I could give any advice or predictions, well, first predictions with the bar. Eh, I don't know what <laughs> when this pandemic is going to end, honestly. I don't know when a vaccination is going to come out. Um, I can't, I can't even look at five years because I don't want to jinx us all, but I hope that we'll be back in person in five years taking this bar exam. And I hope no one has to go through what bar exam applicants have to go through right now because it's really a nightmare. And I wish I could say that I'm exaggerating or being dramatic, but I'm actually not. It's a nightmare. And um, I guess advice for law students would be to don't compare yourself to other people and to definitely 
kick imposter syndrome in its butt. Like you belong in law school. You deserve to be there. You are smart enough. Do not doubt yourself, especially at this, this time. You know, often when you're alone, you try to, you, you tend to get into your own thoughts and your thoughts tend to consume you, especially if you're negative, but just kick those thoughts, <laughs> those negative thoughts, um, you know, find, you know, your lifeline, your support, people to help you um, and encourage you and realize that you can do it and you can get it done. Okay, first, thank you for that hype up, Kamisha. I really needed that advice. I feel a lot more empowered now that I heard that, but I'm kind of in the same boat. I don't really want to make any predictions. I am so new to the legal world that my predictions don't mean anything. I'm still worried about how OCIs are going to go, how I'm going to find a job for summer. So five years is a little much. Um, but if I had to give advice, I will say, take advantage of the resources that your law school gives you. They are trying, they are doing so much. I'm getting emails like three times a day with Zoom things to access various resources. So even though it isn't the same, they are doing the most that they can and you do have similar opportunities and you need to take advantage of those, especially during this time. So that's my advice to all future new law students. As for me, I'm in a similar boat with you, Kamisha and Madison. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I can't imagine that everything's gonna be back to normal for my 3L year, unfortunately, which really selfishly sucks because I had a lot of plans that are probably not going to work out um, that were really similar to what Kamisha was talking about earlier for her, th her 3L year. Um, as for my advice would be, if you are looking to go into law school, take advantage of all of the resources that are available to you, specifically because we live in an online world. Not only my channel, but the, the podcasts of the people who are on this very screen right now, um, the YouTube channels of Kamisha and Madison are amazing resources. There is no excuse for you to not have your questions answered as you're going into this really uncertain area of life. That, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that, that's what I started my, my YouTube channel for was because I had questions and I didn't know where to get those answers. Um, and I know that there were similar motivations for both of you as well. And for those of you here with podcasts, as you guys know, I also had a discussion with um, Los Angeles criminal defense attorney, Arash Hashemi. So I'm going to impart our portion of that conversation here in the video. Good morning. My name is Arash Hashemi. I am an attorney based in Los Angeles, California. I practice mainly criminal defense, among other things in our firm, and I go to court a lot, and that's why Nicole has me speaking about court. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for being here and making time to do this. Um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, what your experience has been like this year with the move to online? Has that changed your daily routine significantly? It has. So in criminal defense, before you couldn't appear online or via phone. In civil, they would let you. But in criminal defense, because of people's constitutional rights, you have to be there in person. But because of COVID, the courts had no other choice but to allow criminal uh, cases to proceed via phone or online. So it has changed considerably. Um, I get up in the morning and instead of driving an hour each way for like a five minute or a 10 minute court appearance, I can do it on, on, on the computer. LA County has a WebEx set up for all the courts. Ventura County has Zoom. Um, and we can make court appearances in a matter of two minutes. Um, if you really want, you can just roll out of bed, turn it on, no video, make your appearance and you're done. Wow, is there a limit to that on which kinds of hearings and appearances you can do virtually? I know a lot of places have struggled with the idea of should we allow trials to be online? And most courts, from my limited knowledge, have said, no, we're not going to do anything online and everything's just got pushed for months to a, a year. Right. So yes, there is a limit. You can't make a, a video or a telephone appearance on a trial or a preliminary hearing. In fact, all of my trials have been pushed back. I, I, there's been only one trial in LA County, an experimental trial a couple of weeks ago, and, and that's the only one. Um, so sometimes you do have to be there in person. And I do go to court a lot still in person. Um, I actually kind of miss the court in person. I, I, I love the, the feeling of being in court, 
talking to the district attorney, you know, seeing the judge, talking to the client, the whole atmosphere. I do miss that. Um, I don't see it going completely online. I, I, I don't think it ever will because of the constitutional rights that have to go along with it. And I think because of, um, if you're doing a trial, you want to see the jury, you want to see their facial expression when, when somebody else is testifying, when your client is testifying, if they are. So I think we're going to go back to the way we were, but not completely. I, I think they're going to incorporate some of these online things. And um, in LA County, they've actually done it. So they resumed traffic trials and arraignments, and they're allowing the arraignments to be done via um, phone audio version for, for people who represent themselves. So oh. in order to, yeah, in order to keep all these people out of court, they're allowing them to do it via phone. I think that's going to be permanent, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense to have that convenience factor. I think it's a lot more efficient. I was talking with someone over the summer at my internship with the Department of Justice in Delaware, and they were discussing how it's much easier for social workers in particular to just be able to you know, not have to sit in the waiting room for like two hours until they can give their little two minute spiel to the court, but they can just pick up the phone, say what they have to say about that particular defendant or witness or whatever it may be, and get back to doing the important work that they never have enough time for anyway. And so I think that you're right, that convenience factor of limiting the amount of time and travel time and waiting time and just being able to pick up the phone when it's your turn to talk. Um, Maybe it, maybe it should go for it, and maybe there's some benefits to that. But you mentioned the constitutional rights, and I was wondering if you could talk more about that because if we weren't if we weren't allowing any kind of like non physical presence before because of constitutional concerns, why are we all of a sudden changing that? Is it just out of necessity, or are we reevaluating? what our constitutional rights actually are in the context of a non-trial appearance? I, I think it's done out of necessity. I know in California, the, the Chief Justice of California has issued emergency orders, mm -hmm. um, and that's why they're doing them. Some people are actually opposing them. I know people that are filing motions opposing these emergency orders uh, because it's, uh, it's hindering the, the speedy trial rights and things like that. So I don't think it's going to be uh, something that makes us reevaluate our constitutional rights. In fact, I think it's going to, in the long term, strengthen our constitutional rights because of this little experiment that we're going through. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know if it's going to, if it's going to stick forever because there's gonna be some opposition to it. Our constitutional rights, like confronting your witnesses, confronting those who are accusing of you, you, you can't really do that online. And so, um, yeah, that, that's the reason that, that they're doing it because of an emergency order. It's not because they're reevaluating our rights. It's just, they're saying that we have no other choice to protect the public from this virus. Totally. Have you had clients that feel strongly one way or another about whether they want to physically be in court? I have clients who don't want to be in court, and I have clients who do want to be in court. Some clients want to be in court, even if they're not required to. So in, in California, if you're charged with a misdemeanor and you're being represented by a, a, a private attorney, you have 977A authority. That's from the penal code 977A. Um, and some of those clients don't have to be in court and they still choose to be in court. Um, funny thing, I'm going to divert a little bit. They're allowing 977A authority on felony cases as well. So we have some felony cases before, if you were charged with a felony, you have to be in court, um, especially if you're out on bail. Now the court, because of the emergency order, is saying that if your attorney appears on your behalf, you don't have to do it. So I, I don't think that's going to be permanent either, but we have to wait and see. Yeah. What advice, if any, would you have to people like me who are going to be entering the legal field in the next couple of years um, on a potentially totally different landscape with this online, these online changes that may or may not be permanent? I think, honestly, it won't affect you as much because you don't know any better. 
and I'm not trying to be insultful. It's, no, it's just when you start the system that's going to be in place, I think it's going to be the system that's, that you're going to start with. So you're not really going to have to adjust. Um, but the advice that I have for you is just the advice I would have for everybody if this COVID wasn't happening. Uh, once you do start to practice law, it's a little different than what you imagined, whether you, it was on TV or whatever it was in your head. So be prepared for that. Be prepared for, I don't want to say a, a, a wake up call or something. I just be prepared. Reality of practicing law is not the same as you think. I'm not saying it's not glamorous. It is. I, I love it. I enjoy it. I think it's glamorous, but it's, it's different. So with this COVID thing, in a couple of years, I, I'm hoping it will all settle down and everything is going to be back to the way it's supposed to be. Now, it might be different than it is now, but for those people who, start, who will start practicing in two years, I think it will be a much easier transition for them than the people who have to transition from the old system to the new that's going to be developing. This is going to be interesting for the next however long it takes. Um, I think that the entire justice system is going to, um, I'm looking for the right word, not evolve, but uh, change itself to, um, to like LA County is, is, is forced to use technology more. And I think that's going to be a permanent thing. And that's a, a bright spot for the COVID-19. Um, so that's going to be what I think is going to develop that we didn't touch upon the effects of technology um, and, and how some courts that refuse to use it are now being forced to use it and I think they're going to uh, adopt it permanently. Um, you can find me online hashemilaw.com it's h-a-s-h-e-m-i-l-a-w.com uh, hashemilaw on Instagram hashemilaw on Twitter and my podcast is hashing out the law you can actually go to hashingoutthelaw.com on Instagram is hash it out. Um, just Google my name. You can find me easily. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much again um, for that insight and encouragement and um, I have words of advice, I guess. I really appreciate it. Everyone's information will be in the description below, um, but if anyone has anything that they would like to verbally plug now would be your time. <laughs> so folks who are in the process of applying to law school, again, I'm Steve Schwartz. I've got the LSAT blog as well as the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. And I'm putting out tons of updates on a daily basis about the new online LSAT Flex, how admissions is being impacted during the time of COVID. So feel free to follow me in the links below or reach out for more. I would just say, check out our website at UCLA. We have a whole bunch of virtual events uh, coming up this fall. I'm doing a, an Ask Me Anything this Thursday, but there'll be a whole bunch of them coming up with current students, with faculty, um, and we're always, I'm always available if people want to email me directly to set up a visit, a virtual visit, and uh, thanks for having me. I wish everybody uh, good luck. Yeah, yeah, so my podcast is actually on hiatus, but, but the, the, they're all available to you. This is a kind of labor of love free podcast that helps students understand the law. We do deep dives. Um, into different areas, rule against perpetuity, that kind of thing. And then I was fortunate enough to have both Steve Schwartz and um, Rush on my podcast, and we talk about LSAT too. So it's available at www.law2fact.com. And as I said, it's really to help you law students learn the law. I guess my shameless plug is just to follow me on YouTube at It's K Yvonne. And I'm just going to shout out my school, Northwestern Prisker School of Law. I enjoyed my experience. So if you're interested in attending uh, law school at Northwestern, I pretty much talk about it on my YouTube channel. And if you need any tips, I will gladly give you tips on my whole application process and whatnot. My YouTube channel is Madison Rector, and I do this in the description of all my videos. My plug is to register to vote. We have an election coming yes. up. Make sure you're exercising your right, register, super easy. So that's all I got. And if you're watching this video, you already know what my channel is. So that's all I've got. Um, thank you all so much for being here and taking part in this conversation. For those of you who I hadn't met before, it was an absolute privilege and I'd love to stay in touch personally. Um, and those of you who have been on before, thank you 
again, as always, for being one of my professional YouTube friends. We love it. Thank you everyone for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel and all of these wonderful people's things. Again, that you can find in the description below. Like this video if you enjoyed the content and want to see more conversations like this. It really helps me out and lets me know what you're looking for uh, in getting your questions answered. I will see you all next week with another video. And until then, God bless. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank